Hello, thank you for coming on a Wednesday night to this Chew Talk. Um, my name is Natasha. I'm an MCR member in the engineering department, and my, I recently graduated in civil and environmental engineering, of which a large focus of my studies was climate modeling. So I hope um, to share uh, one of the types of models that the IPCC uses to generate climate forecasts, and hopefully in the process of these 20 minutes, you can learn something new about the energy sector. Oh, nice. Um, so we'll start off today with uh, a few definitions of energy systems and the disruptive trends that are occurring today. Uh, then we'll dive into the core principles of techno-economic models and then look at a specific example of an integrated assessment model and then conclude with closing remarks. So what is energy? To the many scientists in this room, you can probably answer uh, it's the potential to do work. Um, important to note that it comes in many different forms, um, chemical, nuclear, thermal, uh, which each fulfill a specific type of um, energy service. And it's also expressed in different units, like gigajoules is on a national scale, a uh, million tons of oil equivalent, um, British thermal units, barrels of oil equivalent, uh, tons of ice if you're talking about refrigeration. Um, what is an energy system? Uh, it's a bit more complicated to define, but essentially it's taking some high quality energy form um, and degrading it to eventually provide some good or service. And one way of visually representing an energy system is through a Sankey diagram. So going from left to right, you have some primary energy that's converted um, through different processes to you know, electricity or heat um, that gets then uh, used in a passive system to provide some final service. So these have funky units like uh, passenger kilometer for talking about transport, um, joules for the food you just ate. Um, but important to note is that electricity is not total energy. Uh, electricity actually is only around 20% of final energy consumption. So if people say 25% you know, of UK's electricity comes from renewables, that's multiplied by another 0.2 for your fraction of total energy. So where does it come from? Uh, this is a graph of total primary energy supply from the IEA from 1971 to 2015. And as you can see, there's um, the majority of the energy does still come from fossil fuels. And this tiny gray sliver other is renewables, um, excepting biomass and hydro. So we still have a long way to go. So if we could plan for tomorrow or the future, what would our ideal energy system be? Um, what are we striving for? And one way of thinking about this is called the energy trilemma. Um, and it's a balance of three main goals. And with all trilemmas, you can get two of them, but you can't get all three of them. Um, so this is taken from the World Energy Council. Uh, and it's a balance of these three goals. One is energy security. Um, does supply meet demand at all times? Uh, it's a, is it a reliable source of energy? Two, energy equity. Can we get the energy cheap and affordable? And three, uh, environmental sustainability. So how good is this for the planet? Um, and now, uh, talking about some of these disruptive trends. So we're actually going through quite a radical transformation in our energy sector uh, for several reasons. Uh, one, we have increasing demand for electricity. So if we're going to mine more bitcoins or use electric vehicles, we need to ensure um, a, a supply of electricity. Uh, flexibility. So renewables are intermittent. Um, and this threatens the traditional model of conventional power, uh, where coal and nuclear plants would provide some sort of steady base load throughout the day. Um, but now we have this phenomenon that is called the duck curve. So this is from California, uh, the net load on a specific day in March from 2012 to 2020. And because California has added so much solar PV over the years, um, which only comes on during you know, this um, short period from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., um, more and more conventional power is being brought offline, shut down, and then we'll need to increasingly ramp at a high rate. And that's, this is an engineering challenge. Um, so that's a, a challenge engineers will have to confront. So this is load following. Distributed generation. 
So historically, we'd have coal power plants or you know, nuclear power plants that provide all the power, then goes through a centralized transmission system, and then distribute it to all the houses. But now if we put solar panels on our roofs, we're also going to be prosumers, producers and consumers. And this is a data analytics problem. Um, it will threaten uh, electricity pricing schemes. So what is a fair electricity price if a bunch of people start selling their electricity at random times of the day? Um, so that's another issue. And then resiliency. So this also goes back to the idea of flexibility, but also um, security. Uh, if, you know, if someone hacks a power plant, that's a huge threat. So supply equals demand. You're going to hear this a lot from me tonight. Uh, what are the solutions or the technologies we can rely on? Uh, we can rely on renewables and storage uh, together. Uh, carbon capture and storage. So this is if you're taking some fossil fuel, which is carbon, and combusting in oxygen, you're going to get CO2. And we can isolate that CO2 and compress it and stick it in the ground. Um, nuclear, uh, biogas, hydrogen as a, as a storage um, carrier. And end use, uh, which often gets forgotten. Uh, energy efficiency, we can reduce our demand. Uh, we can build passive house, houses, which can dramatically reduce heating. Uh, smart grids, um, so we don't need all the energy. Uh, we can have a smart grid to determine how much we actually need at what time. And interconnectors. So this is a big, um, uh, a big uh, role in the UK uh, since we um, buy nuclear energy from France uh, through interconnectors. And you can have uh, like a competitive market for power in Europe. And so there are models to um, determine that, but also you get into some other political issues that we can discuss later. Uh, so getting into the meat of it, principles of these energy economy models. Uh, as with all models, you need to make a decision about what's relevant. And as such, it will uh, affect your results. So one is bottom up versus top down. Uh, what type of model is this? So bottom up is more technology specific. It's really taking into account um, you know, the technologies we have, how they're going to learn and improve over time, and generating you know, an, a quantity of how much energy can we actually produce. And top-down is more macroeconomic, so depending on socioeconomic factors. Um, and surprisingly, top-down is more computationally intensive because you have a bunch of economic um, feedbacks. And so bottom-up is what we'll mainly focus on today. Exogenous versus endogenous, uh, what is within your system boundaries? So for example, you might consider um, a, a demand for electricity. We can say, oh, we know we'll forecast the demand for the next five years, and that's a given, versus um, having that work within the model as something you predict. Stochastic versus deterministic, so this has to deal with uncertainty. And it's especially important when you're dealing with renewables. Um, so PGM is a, a regional grid in the US. And this is a forecasted wind um, for July. So it's very uncertain, but you can also average them out over a given time period and work with that. And resolution. So this is taken from the IPCC report. So the first report to the fourth report. And now we're on to the fifth report. And uh, one of the reasons why these climate models have gotten better over the years is the um, increasing resolution uh, of the, the model. But then you also get into a decision of, are you going to have a more computationally intensive model um, for better accuracy or you know, save the cost and have a, a less accurate model? So again, supply, we can rely on different types of um, primary energy sources. We have some source availability that we know. Um, a production function that takes into account the source. Uh, and this can be regionally dependent and time dependent, so during the day, uh, how much wind is blowing. Technological learning. So if we invest a certain amount uh, today, the technology will improve later. Um, and one way of representing this is through uh, these different experience curves. So Bloomberg came out with this that compares how fast solar PV is learning in comparison to batteries. And they say that it's about the same. Um, carbon emissions. 
uh, and how much does it actually cost to produce um, given you know, capital model and financial model. Demand uh, relies more on population uh, forecast, GDP growth, um, and energy efficiency. So can we actually scale back how much we need through um, you know, building, having more efficient heating in our homes, for example? And price, is this something that's uh, worked out in an equilibrium, or do, do consumers scale back how much they want uh, based on the price and objectives and constraints. So yes, again, supply must equal demand, but you can also have a number of different constraints and build scenarios um, that make things interesting. So one that I've seen was um, within a five-year time period, you're not allowed to invest so many billions to upgrade infrastructure because uh, there's a constraint on material and construction. Um, Oh, models are wrong, but some are useful. Okay, yay. <laughs> we got through a lot of the meat of it, and now we get to talk about integrated assessment models. So uh, I'll be talking mostly from the IPCC working paper. Um, and when we predict, or if we want to forecast how much CO2 we can realistically emit before reaching a two degrees uh, temperature rise, that's to do with two things. So. RCPs, representative concentration pathways. Uh, this is um, about a climate forecast. So these numbers represent how much warming is going to happen. So as you get higher, it's, it's higher warming. Um, and shared socioeconomic pathways. So this has to do with population and GDP growth. Um, and this is a, a forecast to the end of the century. Um, interesting to note, though, is if we say we're like around this time was when the report came out, you see that it'll be flat um, or it'll keep going up and then it'll drop down. Um, and this has to do with some economic reasons or how fast we can scale up. Um, and a lot of the, the results from the IPCC came out that uh, many of the carbon reduction methods, like carbon capture and storage, would only happen into the second half of the century. So this is a a time-sensitive model uh, in terms of investment and yeah and there's also large error bars which have to do with uh, parameter sensitivity so GCAM is one of the models that the IPCC uses there are many of these long acronym ones like message and image and timer um, but this is what's a bottom-up policy optimizing and so it's called integrated assessment since you have multiple different models and then you solve them all simultaneously. So we just talked about this blue section of energy supply and energy demand, but there's also land use models, um, greenhouse gas emissions, and uh, temperature change climate parameters. So a lot of the uncertainty that you find comes from these climate parameters. You know, how much, if we emit another mo a molecule of CO2, how much is it actually going to warm? It's quite uncertain. Um, actually, OK, we can get into discussion later, but a lot of the uncertainty actually comes about clouds um, <laughs> and the role of clouds, uh, but economic activity as well. So it's bottom up, so it's focus on technology, and it's policy optimizing, meaning that for every time period, it solves an equilibrium. Um, it says we need to reach you know, this amount by the end of the time period, and then it'll recursively run until it hits a solution. Um, and I'll keep doing that. So, so these are some of the results. Uh, this is a business case as usual. So if we continued on with our current um, consumption, and this is uh, what we would have to do to reach our targets of 80%, um, I think, reductions by 2050. So what you see, just a general um, comment, is that coal and fossil fuels without CCS will be downscaled but then we'll add more fossil with CCS, and energy efficiency will also play a big role uh, in the future. Um, these are different scenarios, so I'm sorry for the print, it's so small, but on the y-axis, it's the cost of mitigating CO2, and depending on your scenario, what you choose, um, you, know, you might choose not to do CCS at all, or um, you know, have limited bioenergy that you can deploy, the mitigation costs will change in order to reach your target. 
Um, so as you can see, if we just demand less energy, and that will be a lower cost. But if we block CCS out completely, it will be a high mitigation cost. Um, these are just different ways of representing the data. Um, so primary energy, where do we get it from? Fossil fuels or biomass and CCS or renewables. And you can compare these results with other models. Uh, and you can see that they're quite different. So we're moving towards more renewables into the future. Um, electricity, where does that come from? Um, again, renewables and nuclear will play an important role. Um, liquid fuel supply. So these are all just different uh, graphical representations. So today, uh, how did I do? OK. Oh, I went quick. Oh, um, Closing remarks, models are tools that are used by policymakers to address a specific set of questions. And as such, they will be designed um, with a limited scope and uh, different constraints to answer those specific questions. Integrated assessment models are some of the tools that governmental agencies use to analyze systems. But uh, this is not the full story. So something that has <coughs> been largely left out is behavior. Um, I think one of the main takeaways from my studies has been the technology exists, we have all the tools we need, um, but we, if we don't have political will, we can't actually do anything. Um, humans and governments are not always rational, uh, so some may argue that the decision for Germany to withdraw its nuclear power was not rational. So these are political or value-driven decisions that cannot be fully captured in a model. Um, and generally, there tends to be more research on energy supply rather than efficiency. And actually, material and efficiency can dramatically uh, reduce our energy demand. But it tends to be more disaggregate. It tends to be yeah, a bit more dispersed and probably harder to implement change. Some references. And I'd like to give a special thanks to the Gates Cambridge Scholarship um, for sponsoring me this year, um, Department of Engineering and Savasan Churchill College. So thank you. Thank you.